So I would like to welcome everyone to uh, our, oops, and more people, uh, our uh, third uh, colloquium of the semester of the Center for Global Ethics and Politics at the Ralph Bunch Institute. Uh, we have one more coming up on November 6th, which is a co-sponsored event with the Political Theory Colloquium um, here. And that will be on democratic punishment. So uh, with Corey Brechneider, and that should be interesting as well. But I'm absolutely delighted to be able to host Leonard Harris here, um, whom I've known for decades, but not, not enough because he's situated at a distance. But Leonard was, in my view, one of the founders and one of the most inspiring uh, members of the early development of uh, critical race theory and Africana studies. And uh, he continues to um, be doing very strong work. So I thought it would be great to have him come and speak. He's currently professor of philosophy um, at um, Purdue University. And he was the recipient of the Franz Fanon Lifetime Achievement Award from the Caribbean Philosophical Association. Um, he's had numerous other um, um, research awards in China and Nepal, and it was a commissioner to UNESCO um, in 2012. He gave the um, Distinguished Lecture Series for the Indian Council of Philosophical Research, and uh, he's in, in participated mm -hmm. in uh, numerous uh, other activities in philosophy. Uh, giving summer seminars on critical pragmatism and insurrection, insurrectionist ethics and other such activities. He, his uh, co-editor of uh, several books, including one on philosophical values and world citizenship, and a co-author um, uh, on a book on Alain Locke, Biography of a Philosopher, that was published in 2008 by the University of Chicago Press. Editor also of The Philosophy of Alain Locke, Harlem Les Renaissance and Beyond. And uh, the editor also of Philosophy Born of Struggle, Afro-American Philosophy from 1917. So among other many um, other writings and accomplishments. And so, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce his talk today on what is necro being, the ethically worst form of racism, and what is the nature of tragedy, parenthesis, necro tragedy. It's all very provocative, Leonard, and thank you so much for coming. After you give your talk, we will have an opportunity for questions. So um, everyone should uh, try to formulate those and be ready to uh, raise hands when the time has come. Leonard, please proceed with your talk. Well, thank you very much for having me in the first place. I'm really invited. I'm, when I am invited, I'm most appreciative of it. That's for certain. Um, and I want to thank all the folks who chimed in. I'm really surprised and impressed and um, yes, honored that you- We're 42 people right now. I'm really honored that you would take the time to, 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 to hear me. Um, that's for certain. Um, I'm, and I have some uh, former students. I have some longtime friends and faculty. Um, and uh, quite a few new individuals. So I am appreciative of your willing to take the time to hear me um, and to listen to the, the, the account. Um, and um, uh, I'll say a bit more about my appreciation a little, a bit, a little bit later. And, um, um, but I think the best thing for me to do is to um, focus on the, the, the talk to begin with and to try and get out what it is that I mean. The theory of necro being is in a book um, called The Philosophy of Struggle. Um, and the book just came out by Bloomberg Press. Um, so it's one chapter in that book. Um, the book tries to define what counts or what ought to count as, as philosophy to begin with, and then what counts as a philosophy born of struggle. Um, for the purpose is to chart out a radically different way of doing philosophy as such. Uh, it, it dumps both the Western and the Eastern tradition of philosophy, or at least that's the intent, and tries to stand on a very different plane. One that is not responding to colonialism or racism, but um, 
uh, or, or asking ourselves, um, what is it to be post-colonial, but rather to be it. And that means to step on it, to live on it in a different way of doing philosophy altogether. Necro being is one feature of that project because one feature of it says that what a philosophy ought to do, and this is a normative claim, is to tell you what you ought to do. Uh, it should say what, 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 what counts as philosophy, not just talk about different methods of argument, different designs of presentation, different metaphysical, or aesthetic, or epistemological questions, but rather say what it is they ought to be doing in philosophy and what it ought to mean. So it's a lecture. Uh, it's about racism. So yeah. that's, 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 that's where it comes from. Necro being is one feature of that, of that project. Um, so let me start with that to, to talk about what it is I mean by it. Um, and with your little help, I'm gonna put up a chart that I think might help me work through the account. Um, so I'm gonna put up this chart. Uh, here we go. Did it come up? Uh, yep. Okay. So I'm going to work through the chart to some degree. Um, Necro being um, is a form of, 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 of a, 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 a necro being, as I presented, is a condition that kills and prevents persons from being born. Um, and racism is just one form of it. By um, necro being, I mean death. I don't mean friendship. I don't mean ideas. I don't mean beliefs. I don't mean cognitions. I mean death. Um, and it's a condition that kills, that it kills people. And it prevents people from being born. By pre preventing from being born, I don't mean abortion. Primarily, I mean people are not able to come into the world because they are mass incarcerated in jail. Black men and black women are very often in jail. And one of the things that you can't do or are most likely to do is to be a good parent or parent at all. So it prevents a whole set of populations from being born. Ill health, bad conditions, high blood pressure prevent the possibility of being a parent. That's what I mean by prevents people from being born. Um, and by necro being, I mean the same thing as the Chevy means, um, death. Racism is a form of necro being. There may be other conditions of necro being in the world, most certainly, but the way in which I want to situate racism is as a form of it. So it kills and prevents people from being born. Racism, on my view, is a polymorphic agent of death. Um, that is, is a, rare, a variety of ways in which it happens, not in one way. Premature births, shortened lives, and starving children. Debilitating theft and abusive larceny, degrading insults. It's insulting to go into a grocery store as a young man and have to buy a bag, uh, uh, to go to the grocery store and buy uh, uh, ancient your mammy pancakes. And hear somebody say, ain't your mammy on the pancake box? It's insulting to see that, but that's normality. Well, it was normality when I came up. These are stereotypes forcibly imposed. You don't get to choose what's in the grocery store because you don't own it. You don't control the land. You don't control the resources. You don't own the factory that produces those boxes. It's not there. Somebody else owns it. So it's a polymorphic agent of debt. It produces a sense of in insecurity, instability. You're insulted. You feel bad. It increases your high blood pressure. You die sooner. Um, racism. Um, in this way, it's kind of a function. Uh, it functions especially in relationship to health and health benefits. Those health benefits occur to a different community than yours. Harm occurs to you, but health benefits don't. Now, I consider death, mortality, and morbidity irredeemable miseries and a primary condition of racism across the array of races, uh, racism globally. That means at least two things. When I look at racism, I don't just look at it in terms of the United States. I'm thinking about the racism in Bosnia. I'm thinking about, uh, against the Muslims. Um, um, I'm thinking about the racism in Croatia. I'm thinking about the racism among, um, among the Buddhists against the, against the Moringa, um, where 
um, persons who are of a different faith, but also seen as a different kind of being and unworthy of being. I'm thinking about the racism in India, where previously the what was called the untouchables or the Dalit uh, were seen as un, so inferior that even their shadows would give you disease. It's not possible to rape one because they're not a being in the first place. That's what I mean by racism. When, when that's attached to religion, attached to ethnicity, attached to senses of otherness, um, 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 and that's a form of racism which is connected also to you know, ethnicity and religion, but it's there as well. I'm thinking about the racism which um, occurs in South America uh, uh, and, and in Argentina, where they killed all the black people, all the Af all people of African descent, and then pretended as if they never had a genocide. I'm thinking about racism within Namibia during uh, be, you know, be, before before the Holocaust in, in Germany. The Holocaust in Namibia wiped out the, the, the whole nearly the whole population. They got to experiment and play with, play with how you're going to kill Africans um, um, uh, because they were not seen as persons. And I'm certainly thinking about the racism in the United States as well. But when I think about racism, I'm thinking about it globally. That's why it's polymorphous. It's not simply one phenomena, but a multitude of phenomena. Racism then is, 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 is that. Now, I know there are lots of other definitions of racism. Now, I know fully well that you have volitionist definition of racism. You have racism that says racism is a kind of disrespect. Racism is a kind of ill will and antipathy. Racism is a consequence of exploitation. Um, um, uh, uh, um, but that's not as obviously what it is that I mean by it. I'm not saying that those are not important ways of seeing racism. I'm simply saying something slightly different. Um, now, racism is a kind of a transfer between a dominant and subjective population. Ill health gets transferred from one population to another. Or what, what, ill health is faced by one population. The next population is not. Um, one way to think about this is um, what happens if you're, if you're, if you're um, uh, 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 underemployed. Part of your underemployment means that someone is gaining profit by virtue of not paying you what they ought to pay you. What are they doing with that money? Among other things, they're providing themselves health benefits. They can afford a doctor. You can't when you've got, because you're underpaid. What if you're uh, uh, underemployed? You're working in a position which you're more qualified for. You're working in a position, although you're more qualified, but you're not getting the benefits of your qualifications. Somebody is allowing you or forcing you to perform jobs and they perform and they, and, they, and they benefit. And one of the benefits they get is that they're able um, to, 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 to afford a better health care. Uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, another benefit occurs um, by, these, by these insults um, and, and, and harms to black people. Another way to think about this is what, do you, what happens when you see black people being brutalized on television um, when they're being uh, uh, beaten by police? One of the things that happens is, sh is shot and fried up. Shot and fried up is the cases in which people have a joy of watching other people being brutalized. And in the consequence of shot and fried up, um, they feel better about themselves. They feel more empowered. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center noted that there's a significant increase in the number of um, hate organizations after the videos are shown. The same happened in the Civil Rights Movement. After black people are being beaten on, 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 and seen on television being beaten, there's an increase in hate groups. So Schrodinger Freuder works in the sense that um, they have a the enjoyment, they get better feeling. So the insults of suffering by black people are correspondingly gain, giving a gain to those who are insulting you. Uh, it's not straightforward, it's not always, it's some folks. It's not, it's variegated, it's, it's dependent upon location, but some people gain by it. Whereas those who are insulted lose. Another way to think about this is, uh, is asset transfer. I had a, uh, a short, uh, 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 a, a short. This is not in the book, but a short uh, commentary on a piece. So I'll put it on here. Um, 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 when somebody dies, uh, a cemetery or crematorium gains. Who owns those cemeteries? Who owns the the company that makes crematoriums? Who owns the funeral homes? Who owns those buildings where those churches are, where they're paying rent? Whoever owns that are gaining by the over deaths of black people. Is the way in which black people are um, suffering 
because of COVID-19, disproportionately. Okay, who is profiting off of this? Some people are gaining off the death of black people. And what, what do they gain? They gain additional money that they would have otherwise if they were not a disproportionate rate of black death. And what do they do with that money? Among other things, provide for themselves, provide their health care. That's what I mean by pretending as if there was a transfer, a ruthless calculation. There's no actual calculation, but if I can imagine a ruthless part where this transfer is happening, where the benefit is accruing to one population over another. And I'm arguing that the most salient indicators of racism are health transfers and death. Now, one reason natural being is a living death that is being that is in no way receives substantive forms of relief, justice, recognition, or compensation. That's part of what makes it so wrong. It's, as, 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 it's acting as if they're in a, a ruthless calculation where um, one population is gaining and another population is losing. One population in loses and another population gains. Sometimes land, sometimes resources, sometimes money, sometimes a sense of self-worth. It's polymorphic in that sense. It's very variegated, depending upon the location. Um, if you're in, in Rwanda, uh, I was in Rwanda during the Holocaust, and in Kikongoro, in Kikongoro, 2,800 people were killed, massacred, and butchered mostly by machetes and, 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 and direct, um, direct uh, clubs. The bodies uh, in, 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 in laid into a, a memorial in, in 13 buildings in Kikongoro. Um, uh, who gained by virtue of that? Hutus and Tutsis, who gained by seeing them as cockroaches, because whatever they wanted, among other things, was their land. Access to the ability to grow tea. Death, necro being. So that's what I mean by the sort of tr imagined transfer as function, as a function of racism. Now, the traits are unique, and the most silly ones, of course, are, 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 are transferring debt. In the worst case scenario, um, these miseries are in no way compensated. They're never heard. They don't get recognized. They don't get paid for. All those people who were lynched in Kentucky, for example, in 1889, uh, 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 1866 and 1950, right? all those 180, 60 uh, uh, something people who were lynched, most of them, well, we don't even know their names. Their families were not even recognized. Death happens, suffering happens, and it's not compensated for. That's what I mean by necro being. It's not there, you don't see it. Most of the people who are beaten in jails, you don't hear from them. You don't know that they're being beaten. According to Angela Davis, approximately three to five percent of the women in, in, in incarcerated in, in county jails are raped, but you don't hear about them. You don't get to know who they are. You don't get to hear their suffering, their pain. We don't know their names. That's what I mean by you don't hear them. They don't see them, they're not there. Where is the wrongness here? Now, I contend that we're in a non-moral universe. Right. Um, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Where is the wrongness? The wrongness, I contend, is that there is no moral theory that makes undue loss of life and death other than intuitively heinous. I don't think there's, other than a sadist theory, what kind of theory is it? This is a reductive out of sodium. What kind of theory is it? that tells you that undue loss in life is okay. I may, other than some a sort of a sadist form of theory, I don't think there is one that can do that. So whatever theory, ethical theory you want to hold, it ought to include in some form that undue loss of life and death is wrong. I'm gonna take it as given that a moral wrong of racism is unnecessary race-based sustaining of shortened lives, physical pain, debilitating diseases and premature death. And it's made possible 
and sustained and perpetuated by the conditions that make embodied well-being itself possible. You go to work and you get paid less. So working gets you in a condition of shortening your life. It's much like a, a white coal worker in, in, in West Virginia going to work in a, in, a, in, a, in a coal mine. The conditions that make life possible for them are also the conditions that are killing them. The conditions that make life possible for people who live in the cities, say in Detroit and other cities, where there are massive dumps nearby your home, you have a nice home, but simultaneously, the conditions, are, those various conditions are making you die. Health and life are assets, I contend, and assets are important. Uh, independent of revaluation and transvaluation. What does that mean? It means a, a couple of things. Um, the one is that life and health are good things. Right? Um, and death among all groups of populations is never a welcome condition. There are a variety of definitions of death. Um, um, but in all of them, the decay, decayed body and no longer being there as a, as a physical being is death. And I can't find any populations or modes that I find it appealing. It's never a welcome condition. This is an asset. So racism for me is fundamentally, more importantly, where it's wrong is fundamental wrongness and why it's more wrong than any other form of ways of seeing racism. That is seeing racism as a function of prejudice or a function of ill will or a function of uh, implicit agreements or biases, all fairly, fairly you know, it's there, but I take it as the worst one that I can find is this, death. Nothing follows if you're dead, nothing. Nothing follows from ill health, nothing. That asset, is the is an asset which you cannot replace. You don't get it back. That's why the wrong wrongness of it is associated more with this than anything else. Death and ill health. That's why the more wrongness also is associated with this in the sense that this transfer, well-being is transferred from one population to another. That is, the, metaphysically, there's no actual transfer. But the way in which it functions is that one population benefits and the other loses. Another way to think about this is what happens to the, Transman the people from Trans uh, 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 Tasmania. They're all dead. Not some of them, all of them. The good Christians killed every last one of them. The good moralists, humanitarians, enlightened liberals killed all of them. The benefit, of course, is that the enlightened liberals who came there to save, help, promote from push values and instill modern virtues, they own the land, all of it, not some of it. They get to say that poor Tasmanians, they lost, unfortunately, we still so bad for them. Thank you very much. Death, that's racism. That's how racism works. Sometimes it maintains the population in a subordinate position. Sometimes it kills the whole population. Therein lies the wrongness, especially since the wrongness is operating in, that's what I mean by, first, Mr. that's what I mean by necro being. What do I mean by necro tragedy? Necro tragedy begins in a world of a non-moral universe. By non-moral universe, I mean just that. I mean, there is no place on the universe in which m bad acts are recorded and good acts are recorded, such that the good acts are going to wind up being outweighed by the bad acts. People who suffer sometimes suffer, and there's no compensation for them. They're dead, they suffer, they die, that's it. Most of them don't get to be remembered at all. Some do, but most don't. And there's no universe where they get justice during their lifetime. Another way to think about this is that members of the civil rights movement in the United States uh, during, the 60s, during, the, during the 60s struggled valiantly to promote equality and civil rights, the right to vote, for example. 
but most of them never got to enjoy it. A lot of those elderly people who marched and died before they ever got to vote. They didn't get compensated for anything, period. That's the necro universe, right? There's no moral universe. There's no place where good outweighs bad. Nowhere else is recorded. So the suffering is, is irredeemable, unrecognized. The members of the are never on the beneficiaries of justice. This is the worst case scenario. Right? This is what I mean by the tragic. Um, uh, 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 there's no future condition in any way compensating those who have suffered or were never born. They were never born, they don't get to have anything in the first place. They were born, of course, they get to have something. The virtuous and innocent suffer. There is no realization of universal interest or human nature in this natural world. No matter what happens to the working class in the future, previous workers don't get anything. The workers that are dead didn't, don't get repaid. There's no universe where they get anything. Means of slave children, for example, raped, beaten, and killed, leave no living record of their misery. None. We look at you know, the book, for, for example, The Way of Death. You have a long list of of African children. They don't get remembered. In my view, individuals are not instruments in a cosmic story. There's no story here where everything gets compensated for. There's no salvation, no redemption, no reparations, no compensation during their lifetime. Their, their suffering is simply lost, pure and simple. And there's very little grieving for these populations for those that are robbed or coming into existence and very little sanctuary for the living. Um, one reason Nico being is a living death, there's being that is in no way will receive substantial forms of relief, justice, recognition, or compensation, because there's no moral universe. Injustice, suffering, good or bad, male malevolence is nowhere recorded in the universe, period. It's not there. The tragic, is absolute, irredeemable, and meaningless affliction, necro tragedy. That's the tragedy. That's what I mean by racism as a form of tragedy. It's totally irredeemable, completely destroying lives. That's necro tragedy. There's no Nietzschean hopes for a, a sense of moral re recompensation or character. There's no sense of the tragic is that which is lost as a virtue of not seen. There's no seeing here. It's not that the colonized are invisible or the, 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 uh, or the black people are invisible to the white people. They're not there at all. To be visible means at least you recognize that, that something is there that you're not seeing. But in these cases, in cases of racism, the people have not seen at all. They're not visible to anybody. They don't get recorded. Under conditions of racism, why would you record what happens to a straw? What's the point of that? You don't. That's what I mean by tragedy. There's no redemption. You can forget about a story where the population gets saved. They don't get saved, they die. Or rather, those who have died have already died. And those who don't get born don't get to come. That's what I mean by racism. Racism happens in these ways. Um, and I can talk a bit more about the various ways in which it happens in terms of explanations um, um, and calculations of ways of seeing this situation and ways of, of explaining it. Um, okay. Now, um, having described this, one of the questions that was always fascinating to me is uh, a question that was raised by uh, Jorge Garcia. He says, um, um, uh, in virtue of what is racism wrong? And my answer to that is death. But he also wants to have an explanation of why racism exists in the first place and how it functions. Very often our explanations are attached to our moralities, our moral accounts. Um, and um, I'm, my lecture today, and this the way I want to focus on, on, on this uh, uh, today, has to do with what counts as necro-being and then what counts as necro-tragedy. 
uh, uh, and I won't spend very much time on, on, on talking about um, the actuarial account, um, but simply to say that the idea is to try and depict and show racism uh, rather than try and explain it. That is, give you a call to why it happens and uh, the consequences of it happening. But rather to say that, look, um, uh, uh, racism happens, the misery suffered by victims of racism happen, even if there's no neat causal chain from individual inv invidious behavior to the misery of an individual or the workings of institutional rules to the misery of a whole population. They happen through the ease of a vast way, a range of association, probabilities, propensities, and relationships. In other words, there's not a single cause that I want to point to. I want to try and say one way to, 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 to think about racism is to try and picture it. Not necessarily try and explain why it happens or what, uh, what the causes are, all the, all the causes, but to see, to, get, to see what it looks like, what this world of misery looks like. Um, um, uh, one way to think about this is why a Dalit or Rohingya woman uh, are considered unrapeable. Uh, and why black American boys are considered unrapeable are uh, very often very two different things. They, I, I don't think you can really understand them unless you understand something about those contextual situations. But knowing what, what it is to be unrapeable may not tell you very much about the situations of the Rohingya women, let alone the situation of black boys who are seen as unrapeable because black men are seen as fundamentally vicious and always invested in, in patriarchy and, and cannot be hurt. Um, because they're fundamentally always guilty of something or other, they may not they may not help you understand the religious and social con conditions of other people. Um, so that's why I'm suggesting a picturing, a portraying, may be very helpful rather than just simply an explanation uh, 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 of racism. Um, so that's 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 the point. Of, 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 of talking about racism um, as an as a, as a, as, as a, a actuarial account. I want to see the exchange. Okay, um, Jeremy, can you knock down the the chart? Uh, my name is Dr. Woody Myers. I'm a physician. Uh, I'm a former Indiana State Health Commissioner. I'm a father, and I'm a grandfather. And if you were listening a week ago, you heard us discuss COVID nineteen. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, uh, we can hear you, but we muted that guy. Okay. I'm trying to stop it. Oh, I did it before. Oh, gosh. You did it. Well, yeah. you can just do it, Leonard, by clicking down the share screen. I'm trying to do that. See the green? Just click on the green, and it should go I'm away. I'm, I'm looking for the green. The green is not showing up. That's my problem. Let me keep trying. And oh, wait. Here you we go. Here there we go. you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Magic. So, are you? Did you want to continue, or would you? No, no, no. Uh, I wanted to the possibility. Of, um, you know, I, I think I've been going on for half an hour now, and okay. uh, uh, I think it's best to stop there with the focus on what counts as necro being, and what counts as necro tragedy. Okay. Um, admitting that I'm giving a, a definition, if you will, or a depiction of what I take is the wrongness of it and why I take it fundamentally wronger than other forms of, of considering racism. Um, Very good. So but, we can open it to questions. And I also just wanted to mention that this event is co-sponsored by the group Minorities and Philosophy, which is, um, ex uh, we have a, a strong presence of that group in our program at the Graduate Center, and I think it's broader than the Graduate Center as well. So uh, if you would like to ask a question, could you please, um, you, if possible, either wave or use the raise hand function. Uh, let's start with Charles Mills. Unmute yourself, of course, and everyone else should try well, to see. Leonard, um, I guess I find your paper odd in various ways. To begin with, it doesn't seem to me to be making crucial distinctions between racism and other forms of oppression. 
we point to things like you know premature death, um, you know people being rapeable, etc. And there are obviously all kinds of horrible things historical in the world, you know, and going on right now. But don't we need to demarcate racism from you know straightforward poverty, which obviously also leads to premature deaths, independent of racism, and the caste system in India. You know, um, we know about the oppression of the Dalits, but I mean, most theorists of race would say that a racialized social system is different from a caste system. So we can condemn all of them, but you know, for the purpose of explanatory clarity and in you know, a definition of getting things. Oops, we lost you. Don't we need to, to draw conceptual lines of life together? So I find that you know, just kind of odd, just, just on the face of it. Mm -hmm. uh, no, um, I'm glad that it's odd because I don't think racism functions as, as a separate sort of reality in a logical system by itself. So I don't think that there's a nice, neat way to separate those things like a caste, forms of racism within a caste, and forms of racism within a, ca a class. I think you have to talk about racism within a caste system. And then when you're looking at a class system, talk about racism within, within a context of a class system. But some singular phenomena that's going to capture both, I think is misguided anyway. So no, I don't think that it's okay. I think that's just fine. But but sorry, if I could just follow up. I mean, some of the characterizations you gave were mm -hmm. just pointing to the fact of yeah. you know premature death, mortality, suffering, right. and you know you could have a class society, a non-racist class society, in which the reasons people are suffering mm -hmm. for these things are because of class oppression and not right. racist oppression as well. Yes, I think I said somewhere in there that what's going to count as racism has got to be race-based. If there's no race involved here, there's nothing to talk about. We, we are talking about something altogether different, that's for certain. So there will have to have a race base in there in order to do it. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, I saw Jolivet Henderson. Good morning. It's fine. Hi. Um, hello to everyone. Um, thank you for the session, Dr. Harris. Um, I want to go back to something that you said about trying to picture um, racism. Mm -hmm. And um, in my work in American studies um, that you know of at Purdue, I'm painting that picture of Black segregated spaces in Shreveport, Louisiana, specifically mm -hmm. Caddo Parish. I'm actually describing and painting the picture of my grandmother's life based on a journal I found of hers from 1948 that runs through the fifties. And in creating this narrative and telling this story, I'm using different disciplines, of course, history and social science and so forth and so on. What I want to know is in painting this picture that I'm creating in the form of a dissertation, um, does the liberation that you talk about is it embedded inside of that picture? Because people have to go on living. The act of living is still happening mm -hmm. as we are dying, right? And so I'm interested in knowing how liberation philosophy or your, or the philosophy, uh, excuse me, how liberation plays a part in the actual path to death, this necro being. Right. Um um, the way we, at this juncture, and talking about necro being, there is no liberation anyway. Okay. Um, 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 I mean, and that, that, when we talk about insurrectionist ethics, I can't. Yes. But when I'm talking about necro being, I can't. Um, because it's a depiction of a condition of misery, which is conjoined with very other classes and a caste. Um, uh, and, and I'm rejecting a, a, a logical system of, of, of where. You have one logic system that's going to tell you just about racism and nothing else. Um, so the ethics, the insurrectionist ethics aspect would be more valuable, valuable that than this. Than this. Right, because necro being is simply going to be depressing in that sense. There is no escape. That is the point. That's what makes it, helps make it so horribly wrong, is that when it's race-based racism, when that variable is involved, when people see other people as fundamentally 
different kinds of biological beings. Uh, when that variable is involved, then um, it's possible to talk about irredeemable life. Mm -hmm. There is no liberation here of the worst form. Um, um, there's no salvation. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, nice, neat story mm -hmm. where the tea loss comes to an end and everybody gets happy. Mm -hmm. It's not there. Uh, you have some several people that want to make interventions. So I saw Grant Silva and then Alberto after that. Hello, Grant. Hey, Leonard. How's it going? It's going. It's so great to hear you. I, I want to uh, pick out some of the metaphysical dimensions of this a bit more because um, I really liked that you brought up um, Jorge, Jorge Garcia. Mm -hmm. For him, he, he's really Augustinian in thinking about the metaphysics of racism, right? Yeah. How, is, how is racism introduced into the world? What's the agent or what's the locus that is bringing racism into the world, right? Whereas the picture you're painting, the, the, the way in which the world is already in a sense non-moral, the racism is already present. It's already here, right? Yeah. And that's one point I wanted to sort of get your, your thoughts on. The second was the, ne the necro being, it's not just going to be a term that describes the victims of racial oppression. It's also a precondition for the possibility of the existence of the racially privileged. That means the beneficiaries of racial violence, in a sense, depend upon the material suffering of the victims of racial violence. So it seems like the necro being isn't just something that's going to apply to, say, Black folk in the United States. It's a precondition for the possibility of white life, right, in light of our, in light of our historical context. And so here I'm thinking about people whose existence is fundamentally predicated on injustice, racial injustice. And that's not a concern with where is the racism coming from. It's more of looking at things as if there's a zero-sum gain where, where the benefit of some necessitates the, the suffering of yeah, others. Exactly. Am, I getting at, am I getting at what you're trying to do? Yeah, there's two things. Yeah, um, um, I have nothing to say about the origin of racism in this piece, right? Um, so in that sense, there's not, uh, where it comes from is, is, is not specified at all. Um, one of the more com features of it, I mean, admittedly, it's a, it's, it's a broad-based piece and it meets some development in some areas. But um, one of the intentions is to utilize examples from lots of different places. Right. So I think most of my examples don't come from the United States. Right. Um, 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 but in all those cases, um, you do have to have a beneficiary. The beneficiary doesn't suffer necro life. They gain, like you said, because of it. The precondition for it, you're right. The precondition for necro existence is the beneficiary. Um, and so one way to think about this is uh, think about MTV. Right? MTV started as a totally racist project by a bunch of liberal white people, right, from the East Coast in Europe, a bunch of so-called fundamentally progressive, humanitarian, socialist white people. And the only people they put on TV were white people. They were dating black people, black women, yeah, happy, 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 and a good old time. But when it came to their business, these white boys, Jewish, Christian, and otherwise, you know, made profit off of MTV by making sure only thing you saw was white people because of white people wanted to see. They were not going to mess up their audience, their primary income. At two or three o'clock at night, you might see some black people, but otherwise MTV was all white, all the time white, and they knew it was white. Talk, David Bowie had an interview on it with him, among other people, saying, look, why are you just putting these white people on all the time? But, well, you know, ain't no black rockers. You know, Michael Jackson, nobody count. Come on at midnight. You know, so you can have these non-biased, theoretically white people who are not fundamentally prejudiced intentionally, but the only way they're going to make some living is to participate in their 
pleasing their audience. It's much like the book, the the, the, the publication philosophy now. I wrote them philosophy now. I said, well, what's, what's, what's going on here, man? It's kind of, you know, hokey tokey. General, you got here. You know, here's something, um, is pretty radical stuff. Here's some, here's some, uh, some, some stuff about homo, homophobia and, 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 and persons being raped, um, and Jewish boys being raped in the Holocaust. Oh, we can't publish anything like that, uh, because we have to satisfy our audience, and our audience are family friendly. We have a family friendly magazine, so we cannot have any substantive descriptions of misery. Well, well, who's your audience philosophy now? Happy white people. They're not going to mess up their audience. Okay. So it can work in a colorblind world, so to speak, for profit. Now, eventually they put on some black people, but in the meantime, the owners of MTV are doing very well. Now they can become real progressive, real liberal, real humanitarian, real New Yorkers. You know, real cosmopolitan, progressive, having made profit off of perpetuating a system that they know to be racist without, for the purpose of profit. Okay. And not the worst of the races. They're not running around saying, oh, racism, that racism, blah, blah, blah. No, they run around. Okay, so that's the way in which benefits occur. Wouldn't that make their existence then dependent on? Yes, they're they're the necro being. No, they're not the necro. The people who are suffering are the ones who are dying. But I think I think you're they're not is, dying. I'm 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 trying to offer. I would say expanding the concept to include the beneficiaries would make yes. it point stronger. The tragic dimensions would pertain specifically to the those who suffer, right? Yes, I, I'm not but, worried about the suffering of those who benefit. I think it would be a stronger point. That's all I'm trying to suggest. Right. I'm not yeah. going. I'm not. I'm not going there. I mean, you know. Um, I remember. I remember. The, the, the I said, "Well, look. Um, uh, the, the, oh, um, um, the, the, the slave master is oppressed too. The Hegelian approach. <laughs> Poor slave that. master. I'm not going there. I'm not going no, there. I'm not going there. Yeah. Poor slave. Poor, poor women in the household or the plantation. I'm not going there. Uh, somebody else, you can expand it, but I can't. I recognize I have limitations. I got that's a limitation. I just, I just can't. I can't. I got limitations, man. Um, Alberto. Alberto's new book. Uh, 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 I'll mention in passing. Redefining racism. It's a fascinating yeah, thank read. You for <laughs> Thanks for plugging that in. I wasn't planning on doing that, but <laughs> yeah, redefining racism is a fascinating, fascinating book. We have uh, some. Uh, chat discussions around the world on it. So yes, go ahead. Oh, interesting. So it's nice to see you again, Leonard. Nice to see you. I feel like I should still call you Professor Harris. You should. You, know, you should. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, okay. So here's my here's my here's my question for you. I'm trying to figure out what the normative significance of your account of necro being is. And so let me just kind of frame this a little bit. So, you know, what, what exactly do you want your account to do? Because, so you have, you mentioned Jorge Garcia. So he obviously wants to standard for moral condemnation, right? He wants to be able to hold people accountable and so forth. Uh, we have, you know, Tommy Shelby and I think also Charles Mills who uh, have an interest in social criticism. Um, that's the term that Shelby himself invokes. So I'm just trying to figure out what you want your account to do. And it's, right. it's in, I, and I'm, I guess if you can elaborate on the distinction between explanation and description because right. what kind of work is it going to do if you're just depicting and not explaining I'm, I don't, I'm not sure what the normative significance could be right. and and here's an, and, and I guess just to finally tie it all together I want to know whether you think necro being is morally bad whether there's something wrong about it because if there's nothing wrong about it then I don't know what the normative significance of your theory is and if uh, if there if it is bad if necro being is bad, then it seems inconsistent with your view of necro tragedy, which says that we live in a non-moral universe. So I'm just trying to figure out if you could sort all of that out for me. Uh, it, it basically, yeah. my questions revolve around normativity. Right, that's easy. Um, and, I, I okay, can do this. Good. <laughs> I can do this. The one is, there's two different questions here, Alberto, and it require two fundamentally different kinds of answers. The one question is about the distinction between explanation and description. 
and the significance of that? Uh, and what kind of work is that going to do? My intention is for it to do the work of uh, giving you a picture, a sensibility, a feeling, um, a, a sense of what actually, what, what this landscape looks like. And admittedly, I'm not explaining, so I can't have a significance there. I can't give you the results there. So whatever significance can, occurs from explanation, I can't get that. But I can get the significance that occurs from depicting, looking at a picture. And I'm simply saying, using an actuarial account or the ways in which actuaries think allows me to see something that I couldn't see otherwise. Um, I can see if I'm trying to explain racism as a function of class exploitation, I don't have a neat way of talking about individuals who are members of the working class who are racist. I've got to excuse them some, in some way. I can show you a picture of what it looks like for workers to hurt other workers. Um, and that seems to me valuable. Now, the second question is different. A non-moral universe doesn't mean that you don't have any morality. You, I think you're missing the definition of what counts as a non-moral universe. What counts as a non-moral universe is that there's nothing in the universe where things like morality exist outside of human agency. There's no principles for which we are matching. There's no view of coherency for which is, we're trying to connect to. So that's what a non-moral universe is. There's no consciousness for which we're trying to uncover. Um, um, it's not there. Another way to think about this, uh, is you've seen the stuff that I've written on, on violence workers. Okay. Um, and people like to believe that, or existentialists particularly like to believe that uh, people, or, and, and so other, some other uh, people like Martin Luther King and others believe that people really have a conscience. And that's just false. Um, violence workers live very happy lives. They do great. There's no world where they get punished. Um, violence workers can be police. They can be women in women's prisons who knowingly watch women be brutalized and go home and have a cooked meal. Um, they can be soldiers who are assassins and have a happy life. Um, there's just no world of consciousness or conscience that exists. That's what non-moral universe means. There's no place to record those things. Um, conceptual space, so to speak, consciousness of the universe. Um, but we can have morality all the time. That's different. Uh, um, so there's no conflict there because they mean two different things. Okay. I don't have a, a theory of moralism, but yeah. You have a bunch of other people. All right, I'm sorry, I'll take less time. Oh, good, that's good. Uh, good question, Albert. Linda, did you have uh, an intervention? Please. Yeah, I just wanted to try Grant's question again, because I think it didn't get quite taken up. I mean, I, I think it's, it's the actuarial account is kind of interesting. It's, it's good to kind of scale back and push out some of the questions that normally get addressed and focus on the, the non-moral universe and what it means to have necro being. But what I took Grant to be asking was not about the suffering of, of people who benefit from death, but just the fact that since there is necro being, there must be beings that are defined by their dependence on or their ability to turn away from. Is that right, Grant? Their ability to turn away from or their dependence on, their material dependence on the um, this death. Yes. And and so so there's there's an implication of your account, given the account of this being, that there are other kinds of beings that have this other that have this other form. That's what I took him to be saying. Not that they right. necessarily that's not the issue, just that there is by implication there is this other form of being. I think that's I think Grant nodding his head so i think yeah i think that's right i mean, I, I mean that's the, the point of the transfer um maybe that can be made more explicit but there is this other kind of being the other part um 
I'm, I'm pr presenting Necro being in this way, is to have a literary moment, if you will. Um, to say things like, this is, this is living death, which seems to be internally contradictory. You're saying somebody is alive, but they're really dead. So um, admittedly, it's a literary moment. It's not going to be literal in that way. So there's a feature of it which is poetic. Um, but there's also a feature which is analytic. And I think he's pointing to the analytic feature. So I admit it's there, yes. You have several others. I want to try Alex first and then Saul afterwards. Alex? Hi. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, this is absolutely fascinating. I, I wanted to know, you, you said that there's no liberation in the worst form of, of necro being, and I took that to be really well described. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether or not necro being might come in a kind of gradient. I guess I'm thinking of situations where racism or colonialism or, or both are really intense, right? And there's this really large transfer, as you would describe it, of well-being, life, death from one group to another. Mm -hmm. But that in the group that is losing out, there is nonetheless um, hope, resurgence, memory of wrongs done to them. Um, how, how, how do you describe it when it's yeah, I think they're when it's partial? They're gradients, most certainly. You know, you have class divides, you know, among black people, you have class divides among the Rohingya, you have class divides among the, 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 the Roma, um, um, the Bosnians, you have class divides among all of those. Some people are better off than others. So yeah, I think I say somewhere, I think I say more than once, the worst case, not the, you know, the, the worst case of this is irredeemable. There's no mention. Um, and it's also false that all these cases, the people get liberated. Sometimes they get annihilated completely. Not sometimes, I mean, not, there's just nobody left. They all did. Um, so yeah, both can happen. Definitely gradient. Okay, thank you. Uh, Saul? Hi there, um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, first of all, I really appreciated the talk. Um, I, I wanted to make a, just a few points, um, if it's okay. Uh, firstly, I wanted to tell you, um, I, I, I especially felt your frustration when you were speaking about, um, I mean, children who are unremembered, it's like, it's like they never existed or people that never had a voice um, in the sense that they're, it's, it's like they may, even, even if they are alive, it's like, it's like, it's like as though they're dead. Um, the only thing I could relate that to is from my own background is from the Holocaust itself. And you, you, you kind of mentioned the Holocaust a few times also. Mm -hmm. And um, from, my, from my traditional background, I, I was always taught, for instance, that one who embarrasses his friend in public, it's as though you killed him. And for instance, one who saves a life, it's as though you saved the whole world. And it's the same sort of rationale, which is, we don't know how many lives the lives you save will give birth to. For those six million Jews that were killed, we have no idea what kind of progeny they would have had. They, they could have created cities, countries, the whole world. So um, I, I kind of understand that, but, and, and that, sort of, that sort of ethic allows you to, to put your own actions in check because you, you have to consider all the downstream effects of your own biases and, and hopefully act accordingly. The only question is, and this is a question to you is, how does that allow you to sort of enact justice retroactively. So um, I, I, these, these types of injunctions, when, when it comes to justice, I find very hard to enact, which brings me to, to my point number, that's my question number one. My question number two, um, and, and maybe, maybe this may be a point of, of, uh, of disagreement, is, is, is when you were talking about that, that there's no universal or, or cosmic narrative. And that of course, there's no way, there's no way to prove for or against the universal universal cosmic narrative. My own, I happen to have a tradition where I, I, I believe in one, but that's there's no way to know. I have no way of, of demonstrating this, but from the Holocaust, I could say that it seems to me that the people who did evil got what was coming to them. You know, yeah, that's false. Right. So right. So we like I said, we may disagree. And, yeah, that's false. Most of them live happy lives and die. I'll I'll tell you, I I. What I find fascinating, yeah. what I find fascinating is the very people they ejected, the people they threw out of the universities, including Einstein. Those bombs that they sent, the bombs that they sent 
well, I'm sorry, the, 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 the military that they diverted to, the, to their concentration camps. It was, own, it was all, it all came into their own undoing. And, and of course, and, and, and I, I, at least, you know, the only thing that provides me with is that is at least the, the justice that I can't do, I, I have to at least put, I put that on the big guy. <laughs> okay, let me, ask, let me respond to that. Yeah. Yeah. Sal, let me respond. Yeah. Okay, you're wrong. Okay, A, there's no cosmic world where the, the big guy's gonna fix anything. B, the, um, um, most of the people in Germany live a really good life and die happy, right? Um, and simultaneously, the Holocaust, as I mentioned, I think were the Holocaust in Rwanda, Bosnia, uh, the Holocaust in, Tan in Tasmania. I don't oh. think I mentioned the so Holocaust. You didn't, you were, oh, I'm sorry. Let, so I let me finish. I, gotcha. I don't think I mentioned it, you did, okay? And not only that, the okay, people sorry were there that. in Europe, not only were perpetuating the Holocaust on them, they were also killing communists, they killed black people. And in the same group of people who were pushing universal liberation for the Europeans were simultaneously raping and killing Africans. They were simultaneously colonists. You know, they didn't mind killing Algerians, the French, during the fight in the fighting. The Belgians didn't mind stealing gold golden diamonds out of the Belgian Congo, while well, simultaneously fighting one another, fighting over which white person was going to be inferior or inferior. In the meantime, some of their other members will make a good deal of profit off the misery of black people and the misery of people in the third world. So this is not a neat picture. Oh, I, those, I folks, to... those folks, let me finish. Those folks don't get redemption. They didn't get redemption at all, they don't even get mentioned. So when you say Holocaust and you don't even mention these other people's Holocaust, what about them? Where is their cosmic justice? No, I, 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 I don't believe in the cosmic justice in the first place. We know we're gonna go, we're not gonna get there. We're not gonna fix that part, right? That's okay. okay. <laughs> we're, not gonna, we're not gonna fix that part. You know, um, we're also not gonna yeah. fix is retroactive redemption justice. The people who died and suffered are not going to get anything. They Thank died and suffered, they got buried, or they didn't get buried at all, they got eaten by animals, they're not going to get anything. No matter what you do now, it's for you now. That's what I, I agree with that, for sure. Right? The other folks ain't getting nothing. Okay, thank you. We have some other people that wanted to uh, join in, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, Haraba, Dennis? Hi, uh, my name is Arva. I'm uh, also in American Studies at Purdue University. Um, so I'm thinking about the way that some people in Black Studies, I'm thinking specifically about Sidia Hartman and Zakia Jackson, have talked about the usefulness or maybe lack thereof of the term human and humanity. And I've noticed, I noticed when you were describing necro being, you didn't necessarily use the term human to describe necro being. Um, so I'm wondering if you see any useful usefulness in employing the term humanity, and if so, what would that usefulness be? Well, I'm I'm a, I'm a humanist in the sense that I think we're all members of the same family. You know, I think we all we all there's only one family, and that's the human family for me. I'm an eliminativist. I don't believe in race. Right. So I know some people are gonna hate my guts for that, but I don't. Right. Um, um, uh, but I do believe in pushing black interests. There's a whole other story to that. All right. Um, 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 so I think that uh, yeah, I think it's a good thing to talk about humanity as a single family, right? Now, there's another part of this when you talk about the conception of humanism. Um, that becomes very complicated because the humanists have not been don't have a very, they do not have a very good record. Right? Um, part of what they want to do is to impose the criteria of what counts as being a genuine citizen of the world. And they use their criteria for what counts as being a genuine citizen of the world. What counts as being truly civilized, they want to use their criteria for what counts as genuine civilized. Okay. Um, um, so um, I do think you should be leery of the humanist. Um, but I also don't think you should abandon the term. I don't use it because I don't want to be involved in the complexity of it. Humanity or, or human? Would you describe Humans. necro beings as human? Well, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, people are people are people. I mean, yeah. 
what happens with mental beings is that they're not treated as if they they exist at all, or that they, they count as human. Uh, I mean, that's part of the, the oppression. But I do avoid the use of the term whenever I can, because I do recognize how it gets, you know, abused and used. You know, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, are there any other uh, questions or comments? As I think I've called on everybody. It's hard with so many screens. Oh, yes. Just a minute. Nice. You still have 42 people here. Just, just a minute, yeah. Just a minute. Oh, okay. There we go. So, uh, do you have any more? Uh, I do. I want to come back to the, her question about humanity, humanism, if I can. Um, uh, oh, I see one more question after you. I think they're expressing the sense of, you know, frustration when you see the humanists um, promote um, uh, criteria that seem to exclude so many people. You know, um, uh, they they tell you that everybody is spiritual, for example, but they denigrate African religions, um, or they, they, you know, they, they pretend to tell you that. Um, um, uh, what counts as appropriate behavior at a dinner table is to have a knife and a fork and either a square table as opposed to a round one. Uh, so humanists can be very ethnocentric, if you will, and define when it comes time to starting to define the specifics of what counts as being a member of the human family. Um, so I think that's what they're, they're worried about, is the ways in which people get excluded uh, from the family, so to speak. You have one more question. Uh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. From Claudia, one of our followers. Claudia? Hi, yeah. Oh, oh. my. Um, Video is off. It's more a uh, comment or like, um, yeah, and I, I don't, is it Araba? Um, I, want, um, I wanted to, I think the human is fundamental, fundamental in the argument that like I heard put forth because if necro being is death and obviously we know non humans can die, um, but specifically <laughs> the factors like I heard outlined seemed pretty tied to human forms of death. Um, like even mentioning mm -hmm. cholesterol and blood pressure, if I remember correctly. Mm. Um, so to me, I felt like, I think the question's important, but to me, I kind of heard that as inherent. Like that there was a biological basis <clears throat> that's rooted specifically in the human body, at least in the, this argument being put forth. And I think part of why I brought it up was, I guess, part of the answer that Professor Harris gave was in the context of, um, I'm thinking specifically about Cydia Hartman's Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, um, and the way that she talks about um, humanists' prior preoccupation with uh, like race science and, and eugenics being so rooted in trying to uh, categorize who is human and who isn't. Um, Hartman sort of theorizes that there might be ways and possibilities of thinking about uh, Black people as, or not being less beholden to definitions of humanity um, to sort of hopefully uh, envision a way for liberation forward. But I think, especially in like the universe of uh, the necro tragedy, that doesn't really, it's yeah. not useful or applicable here. Yeah, I think it was like the applicability I wanted to. But yeah, you know, I meant that it's anthropocentric in the sense that I'm only talking about human beings. Um, and so in that sense, it's, it's very anthropocentric. Um, and I don't say anything about animals. Um, we haven't gotten there because under conditions of necro being, uh, people are not even there. Um, so the distinction between um, human beings and other animals don't, don't really matter um, because they're, they're not, they, don't, they don't even count. There's one thing to talk about, 
we're talking about people dying. It's another thing to say um, those who are dying don't even count as dying. Um, so there's various features of what we talk about when we talk about natural being. Sometimes it's analytic, sometimes it's poetic, sometimes it's metaphorical. Um, living death, you're alive, all right, but um, um, you're living in a way in which is going to cause you more misery. Um, um, you know, um, um, there's a, a book called um, um, When They Call You a Terrorist, right? Um, I can think of her name. Um, um, you know, her brother is constantly going to the hospital, and the hospital, um, and he comes out and he's facing incarceration. Uh, he comes out of incarceration and he's facing the hospital again. So the more he tries to survive, the more harm he gets. Um, uh, that's living death, you know. You, you, you're working hard to, 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 to survive, and what you're doing you're in, a, in a system that's going to cause you harm all the time. You're going to get humiliated all the time. You got to constantly report to your correction officer. How are you going to have a job? You know, any kind of job you get, they're not going to pay you enough to pay your child support. They ain't going to put you in jail because you don't have the money for child support. Then you're in jail, you're facing brutality and beating. And then if you fight, just fight somebody in jail, you have to stay there longer. And then once you get out, you have less chance of having a decent job. So once you get out and try to have a decent job, then you're going to get put back in jail because you're not paying your bills. This is a, you know, it's not a, it's, and, and who's profiting off of this? The judges, the clerks, the lawyers, the bondsmen. Where do these people live? They live in the suburbs. <laughs> That's where they live. They live in high rises. Uh, they're getting paid by the government. They're getting paid by you. So that's what I mean. When we look at that reality, it's very difficult. Uh, what do you do if you're a, 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 a Roman in, in Yugoslavia? You work on a, uh, uh, you work in garbage piles. You pick garbage. That gives you a living. But picking garbage simultaneously gives you death. So the conditions that you need in order to survive are the very conditions that cause you death. Simultaneously, you're constantly insulted and seen as inferior because you are working on a garbage pile. Wow. Well, so, so your very work, your very life, perpetuates your constant subjection. That's living death. Mm, well, uh, thank you for the forceful talk. I can't say it's been very cheery. But. <laughs> Um, plus, we have an election, too. So on that uncheery note, or hopefully more cheery note, I'm going to unmute everyone, and maybe we can all just give a round of applause for this fantastic. Uh, 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 uh,